When I studied harpsichord at the uh, Hilversum Conservatory, I was I went with uh, with all the pupils of Jacques Och on a large trip to museums in Denmark and Germany, and that was my in fact my first uh, encounter with originals that were sometimes in playing condition, and um, the poor harpsichord I had at home was. You couldn't compare uh, the sound of what they did, uh, what they do. So that that made made my my interest in how the originals were and how they sounded uh, grow much. And um, there was a huge conference in the Gemeente Museum, The Hague, with all the playing um, original harpsichords and a lot of copies by Dutch builders. And all these instruments were played. In a, in a row, one piece by Swaling by the same player, so you could really compare what it was about. So lots of interesting things were going on. And um, well, <clears throat> I had found my 1824 Konrad Graf piano in Vienna f during that time and started to work on it, met restorers in, uh, in Amsterdam and The Hague. Um, in the conservatory in Hilversum, we had this poor uh, Zuckermann Stein type uh, for the piano kit, which didn't work very well. And, and someone asked me if I could improve it a little bit. And that is how things started. Just working on harpsichords, working on kits. I think early pianos, the early, the, the Steins and the early Walter, that is really interesting. We have so few instruments from the beginning, from, from the eighties. And they are so much more interesting than the, let's see, let's say the Walter everyone copies. They are much more, they have a different sound. It is not really a Beethoven kind of piano, which is supposed to, to grow a little bit. Um, but it's direct and, and uh, the, the quality of sound is really diverse. And the differences between the, 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 the instruments by the few Viennese or South German builders we have from the 80s or the early 90s, they are immense. The Steins have a kind of nasal kind of sound, especially in the middle part in the tenor, which is caused by the construction of the soundboard. And uh, that is very special. Um, you can, in fact, you, I can, I think, recognize from a sound example if if a piano is a Stein or a Dulcan because Dulcan copied the the action and how the instrument looks from outside but not from the inside because he didn't know that and the earliest Walters there are um, there are a few in playing condition and they are really beautiful they, they keep the sound in one part of the soundboard so the sound is very direct and much brighter than the later type of Walter piano. And if you use the knee lever, if you raise the dampers, it becomes louder and longer, but it's not that it goes over the full width of the soundboard. So the sound is much more an individual thing, which is for Mozart wonderful because the colors of the different regions of the keyboard are really different. What I'm, what I'm building now is, um, it's in fact a Stein with, it's in fact two Steins. It's uh, the case and everything is, is a copy of a 17, uh, 1783 instrument which is kept in the museum in Leipzig. But the, the, it has two keyboards uh, with this, the action is mounted on the keyboard. So it's two actions and one is the type of action that Stein built around 1780. And the other one is the action we all know um, with leathered hammers, uh, which he made from 82 or so on. Um, the one with the earlier one has hollow wooden hammer heads with no covering, but the, the instrument is, is equipped with a so-called moderator. It's a wooden strip with tabs of leather in this case which are inserted between the hammer and the string and they make the fortepiano sound. There was one visitor to uh, Stein's workshop and he wrote that he liked the fortepiano sound but not the spinet sound. 
because when you remove the moderator, you get the bare hammers to the strings, and that makes a kind of harpsichord-like or spinet-like sound. We know Stein made this type of action, uh, not from any existing instrument by Stein, because we have only so few, but um, one of his pupils, uh, Schiedmeier, uh, worked for Stein until 81, and it seems like he copied Stein's action, as he had learned in Augsburg, uh, until his death, early 19th century. And these instruments are reported to have bare hammers, and in descriptions from the 18th century, um, it's written that with removing one of the registers, you get an incredibly loud sound, uh, good enough to, 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 to be accompanied by an, uh, an orchestra 50 instruments large. So that must have been extremely loud, and that is exactly what you get when you have the bare hammers to the strings and uh, the dampers lifted. Uh, there's another builder in Florence, Sodi, Vincenzo Sodi, and he copied Stein's action and Stein's case shape. And we know that uh, the Archduke Leopoldo had a Stein piano, so he must have seen a Stein, and it was a short Stein. This instrument here is about 220 long, and that one, uh, Sodi's is 175, and we have a combination of an organ, chest organ, with a piano on top by Stein in Göteborg. That instrument is also 180 long. If we would um, uh, take the two instruments that form the vis-a-vis -vis in Verona, which is a two manual harpsichord on one side and on the opposite side one piano, that piano was also a short piano. Uh, so that is something he also did. So the Sodi is described in a, in a newspaper article uh, with the same like uh, the description of the Schiedmeier instrument that it's incredibly loud when you remove the moderator. So that's obvious that he had also bare hammers. And there's in fact in, in uh, Weimar is an instrument by a pupil of Stein which still has his bare hammers. So it's, it's something that was there. Um, of course it was used in the square pianos, in the so-called pantalons, the, the, the little square pianos without dampers. Um, but in large wing-shaped piano, this it was more rare. We know there were wing-shaped forte pianos in the 60s already. There were four instruments by uh, Heinrich Silbermann in Paris in 61. Uh, but they were all based on Christofferi's invention. They had a Christofferi type of action. And Stein did something else, and he became famous for doing something else. Um, what we had beside these very expensive and complex um, uh, Silbermann and Christofferi pianos, there were lots of square pianos with simple actions, with, uh, there are only German terms for it, Stoß actions or Prell actions. In one, the hammer is uh, propelled towards the strings by pushing it from below and in the other action which I can show you a little bit here it is the the beak this is what we call the beak is grabbed by an action part and so the hammer is moved towards the strings that is a different kind of action and we had this action but without the movable escapement lever. The importance of Stein's invention is not only that he made this thing movable, because in earlier pianos we had something solid, a prelleiste. Um, the other thing is he made this stepped, stepped beak. Um, he has a nice and, and interesting remark in his notebook. There are a few remarks on the forte piano, on clavichords, on the vis-a-vis -vis flugel, probably two harpsichords, um, where he has added later in pencil the remark that the ungrief, or the part where the hammer is grabbed, should be below the center below the axle. If it is above the axle, as in earlier square pianos, like the Baumann uh, square pianos, it is higher and it moves in a circle, 
So the end moves towards the escapement lever. As here, it moves away from the escapement lever, which makes escapement possible. And that is his great invention, which was this type of action. This is, of course, not Stein. This is an early Walter, made from scratch. <laughs> but this is what they did in southern Germany and in Vienna. And this became the famous German action, which was built until about 1900. Um, the advantage of this action is it is extremely precise. And as long as the hammers are as light as this, it plays wonderfully. But when they got bigger, and when you got bigger and more romantic pianos in the 19th century, they become unplayable. Okay, uh, what was the world of domestic keyboard instruments uh, in Mozart's time, in the time of Stein? When you read the preface of Carl Philipp Emanuel's first book, uh, on playing the keyboard. He mentions passing by the newly invented forte piano, which is difficult to play. Um, when we go to the preface of uh, Turk's Klavierschule, which is 89, I think, there are more than 15 types of forte piano type instruments. Um, so something exploded between 62 and 89. Stein was in the middle of this development. He was born in Heidelsheim, son of an organ builder. He went to the famous Silbermans in Strasbourg in 49, where he came to work for Johann Daniel. Uh, Johann Daniel Silbermann, we don't know that much about him. The, the three brothers had a, four brothers had an organ building shop. But um, when their famous uncle Gottfried Silbermann in Dresden died, uh, Daniel inherited all the all the materials and equipments. And uh, the, the other Silbermann we know, is, who was famous for his forte pianos, was in Strasbourg. Uh, so we don't know how this type of Silbermann piano came to Strasbourg. But of course, there is the family connection. But we don't know if Stein ever, in, when he was with the Silbermann, if he learned something about forte pianos. Because he has a notebook, which is still in the possession of his family. And from the period when he worked in Strasbourg, it's only about organs, what he wrote. After Strasbourg, he went to Regensburg, where he worked for a few months with uh, Spat. Um, from Spat, we in fact only know he made harpsichords and later, and clever chords, of course, and later forte pianos. And we have, in fact, two forte pianos, which are more or less harpsichord cases with teeny little hammers in the space where normal your three rows of jacks are. Um, very short, um, set in motion by a sticker mounted on the back of the keys. Um, like an English square piano. Um, I don't know if they were, if they lasted very long, but we've got two, but we have no harpsichord. Uh, no harpsichord by Spat has survived. So, in fact, we don't know what he was, if what kind of um, keyboard instruments he was making beside organs when Stein was there, because Stein helped him uh, with one of his organs. Um, when Stein settled in Augsburg the next years, uh, there had been an organ builder, of course, and he had also already advertised uh, small square pianos. We have a few um, advertisements um, from instruments invented by Stein. We have a list of instruments he made since he settled in Augsburg, but we don't know when this list was written. Uh, so, in fact, we have no hard clues when he invented what. There is an advertisement for a so-called polytoni clavicordium which was a double manual harpsichord with a 16 foot, the normal disposition, he writes, uh, and a forte piano, wing-shaped forte piano, below with the lid opened towards the floor. Um, I can't imagine what kind of an action that instrument much, uh, must have had. And it didn't survive. He took it to France and, and sold it there 10 years later. But we have his vis-a-vis -vis 
which is kept in Verona, the, the instrument with a uh, harpsichord on one side and a forte piano on the other side, which is a clue for what he did, but since the instrument has um, such a funny story how it became the instrument it is, um, it's difficult to draw fair conclusions because Stein started the instrument out as a double harpsichord, double manual harpsichord on one side and a single manual harpsichord on the other side. At some point he decided to change that into a forte piano. But he had his um, harpsichord case. In a harpsichord um, the keys stop at a bulkhead in the case and in his famous um, German action, where you see the hammer here, there is the space where the hammers go through, is in front of the back. It means that the soundboard has to overlap this part of the keyboard. Um, it, it also implies that the case he had made for the vis-a-vis -vis could not have his, his uh, South German action. Stein's great friend was Ignaz von Beke, who was uh, in charge of the music chapel, was composer in Uttingen Wallerstein. Um, his employer started a big orchestra for the, for the, for the court. And uh, von Beke traveled all along Europe to contract players. Um, and um, Mozart's daughter, Nanette, was a very good player and uh, Mozart, uh, when Wolfgang Mozart visited Stein in 77, he also wrote about her playing and that she was sitting on the right of the keyboard and making grimaces and um, she was playing music by von Beke. Uh, Mozart borrowed a Stein piano in Vienna uh, that was owned by Countess Thun and we know from Charles Burney years earlier that Countess Thun's uh, favorite composer was Ignaz von Beke. So Mr. von Beke was a factor, uh, was, yeah, was of some importance in this world around Stein. We know uh, the court of Oettingen-Wallerstein, there were in 1792 or one, there were more than six forte pianos, several by Stein and several by Spat. And uh, Mr. von Beke composed a Sonata for one harpsichord and two forte pianos for Countess Thun and her two daughters. So there's, this is only Van Baker. There were more composers. There were um, composers in Mainz, um, Steckel, uh, for instance. There were, we know, composers in Naples who composed music for a Stein piano. And for von Baker, we can also say the music he, was, he composed was for a Stein piano. That is interesting, I think. And today, indeed, you can find all this music on the Internet. He, he borrowed Countess Stein's instrument for, for several occasions. For, uh, uh, there was a benefit concert for the uh, widows and, and orphans of deceased musicians every year and Mozart played her piano and the famous contest with Clementi he used the piano too but at some point in in 82 or 83 he he bought a piano by Walter because he probably because he could afford it Walter had lots of second-hand or repaired pianos in stock and uh, we are lucky to have that piano still but we also know that for instance the um, coronation concert in in frankfurt he played a concert and used the stein um, when he was in prague uh, he stayed at at count tunes and he had a very good forte piano at his place at his room we know uh, count tune also had a stein piano so probably it, it didn't matter if it was a walter or a stein equal Uh, how do you start building such an instrument? Um, you can buy a drawing. There are drawings of for the pianos and the main reason why we have all these Walter copies around is the fact that there is a drawing from which you actually can make an instrument. 
But uh, for me, um, the first instrument I made was from a drawing with mistakes and uh, things were lacking. And it was very difficult to make that into a working instrument. So what I do is, uh, as much as possible, I, I make my own drawing and I pick instruments I like. And um, if possible, I use a X-ray. Sometimes there are more of the same type by one builder, so you can compare them. One thing which is almost always missing on the drawings you can buy is, for instance, the thickness of the soundboard. And this is very important for the sound. Um, so I try to do that all myself by going to museums uh, when colleagues have an instrument with the soundboard out. I try to visit and, and measure things. So um, I travel a lot and, and try to see a lot. For the future, future of making nice keyboard instruments. Um, I see some problems with materials. Um, this ebony, uh, it's very difficult to get. There, what you, see, what I very often see is that it wears out very much, and it's not as fine grained as you would like to. Um, I went with the key, one key, uh, covered with 18th century ebony of a Straube Klevercourt to my wood dealer in Amsterdam and said this is the quality I'm looking for and he had never seen it <laughs> because it doesn't grow that slow anymore. Um, so the quality of your materials is, is a problem I think at the moment. Um, what Christofri used it is known but it's not exactly known it is Dante leather but what kind of an animal it was from we don't know for sure. Uh, the description of an early Silberman for the piano was it sounded kugelrund, so very dark. And um, in later instruments, in, in Viennese instruments, we see uh, Scandinavian leather that was used for gloves. It's brown, it is first oil tanned and later uh, vegetably tanned. Uh, it is what we know today is, as a kind of Suede leather with a nice flesh side towards the strings. This is not available anymore because it was from a long hair sheep and it's not really domestic anymore in, in Europe. And it's very difficult for tanners to, to find out how that was done. I know of some experiments and that leather is very often very hard. Um, so we've, look, we've been looking for alternatives all the time and uh, about 30 years ago I learned from this Taurus to always look for nice suede leather jackets and as long as it's not stretchy you can use that leather very well but it's not available anymore. Second hand it's very difficult to get good stuff and that is only the story about leather. We have strings, we have wood and it's all becoming more difficult. And I don't know what um, pollution is going to do because if you look at uh, forests here with nice pine trees and, 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 and fir, um, for me there's already a difference in sound uh, from uh, a soundboard made from nice uh, spruce from the French Alps or the same kind of wood from Bohemia and uh, if if the quality of the wood is going down like it is today it will be even more difficult in the future. The intruder! Oh my! Um, <laughs> um, uh, the famous Utrecht harpsichord builder Willem Kruisbergen was a good friend of mine for quite a long time. Uh, when I studied harpsichord, I could study at his home. And uh, we went for years to the gym together. And he was fond of uh, Harley Davidson bikes, but he also had a very fast, um, or oh, what was it, a Kawasaki Ninja. And he invited me for a sl small trip and um, so I was on the back and that was my first time on the back of a motorbike 
And years later, I thought, ha, huh, you can do this yourself too. So that is how this motorbike came into my life.